I'm Alan Smith. If you want a beautiful garden, you don't have to plant year after year. You'll want to grow lots of perennials. And I've got tips on some of the best plants for growing in full sun, as well as those plants that prefer shady locations in your garden. I'm a hopeless collector of perennials. You know, those plants that return year after year in our gardens. So I'm always looking for new ones at nurseries or even ordering them through the mail. Their popularity seems to be at an all-time high. I guess it's because they come back year after year, and there's so many varieties with interesting foliage and flowers. The basis of creating any beautiful garden is understanding the needs of the plants and learning how to make them thrive and understanding that some plants grow well in the sun, while others prefer the shade, will go a long way in helping you establish a beautiful garden that you can enjoy for many years. In just a few moments, we'll visit a flower farm with 1,300 varieties of daylilies, and then we'll see how all of these varieties can be created by visiting a plant hybridizer. And we'll take a look at the queen of the shade-loving plants in a beautifully landscaped garden. And I'll show you how to enjoy your perennial blooms indoors by making a simple flower arrangement. I had rather have a flower than a new dress. <laughs> Believe it or not, the experts tell us that we're buying literally billions of flowers and plants for our gardens each year as the craze for gardening continues. Before spring fever sets in, flower shows such as this one in Boston attract thousands of gardeners eager to get their hands in the soil. I call it educational entertainment too because there's really something for everyone here. You don't have to be a, a plant uh, enthusiast extraordinary. You can just be someone who wants to know how much lime do I put on my fertilizer or what's that little green where am I on my tomato. It's really a, a place where you can learn something and really have a great time. Visiting flower shows and garden centers not only gives us a jump on the spring season, but it also gives us an opportunity to see how perennials can enhance our own gardens. Another way to check them out is while they're in full bloom and in the garden. If you're fortunate enough to have a flower farm such as this one in your area, you can learn a lot more about how a particular flower will perform in your garden. And if you're looking for a sun-loving perennial, you'll find that this one is hard to beat. If you have full sun, I'd recommend daylilies. They are the easiest to grow, and uh, I have th approximately 1,300 different varieties. And they bloom, uh, they bloom early, and mid-season and late. Sybil Sims has been growing and selling this popular flower to the public for over 35 years. Well, I think the Stellas are the, for the beginner, because it blooms a lot in the summer, and uh, the Stellas are real pretty. They, they will, they're yellow, and they go with a lot of different colors. Do you have a favorite of all of these different daylilies that you raise? Well, I think Hellman is my favorite. It is a yellow with uh, brown edges, and it's a, got a pie-shaped ruffle, and it is a, a seven-inch bloom. Now you sell a lot of daylilies each season. Tell me how you how you sell them. Uh, I choose three days uh, when I think they're at the peak of their bloom, and then I have my show, and uh, I have people to come out and pick out the lilies they like. And that way, they see what they're getting, and they can uh, uh, come back and get them when I dig them. And they can put them out, and even if in the hottest part of the summer, they, they're tough and they'll survive. Well, there are thousands and thousands of varieties. That's right. They are, and each year there's more, different right. ones. So it's it really, uh, you know, you have to really study them. Whenever you have as many as I have to decide just which one you'd like. <laughs> I had rather have a flower than a new dress. <laughs> For
For me, the best value in plants is generally determined by three factors. I want them to be low maintenance. I'd like for them to bloom for a long period of time, and I'd like for them to come back year after year. Well, I know this may sound like a tall order, but there are actually a lot of plants out there that will fill this criteria. One of the best examples is the daylily. In fact, these guys have another attribute. They can be very vigorous growers, often doubling in number from year to year, to the point that they really should be divided every three to five years to continue good blooming. I found that the late summer is an excellent time of the year to separate and transplant clumps of daylilies. By doing it now, it gives them an opportunity to settle in before shorter days and colder temperatures set in. Also, by moving them now as opposed to the spring, it's been my experience that they actually seem to bloom better. There's really nothing to dividing daylilies. Just carefully lift the clumps with a sharp shovel and gently remove the soil from the roots so you can begin to see the individual plants. Then with a knife, separate each plant and remove any foliage that appears dead or diseased. You know, it's hard to believe but that one clump produced 10 plants. Now just cut off the foliage at about half and they're ready for transplanting back into the garden. I'll space them about 10 to 12 inches apart, put them in full sun, and keep them well watered until they're rooted in. We've all noticed the simple beauty of wildflowers along roadsides or in meadows. Many of us, including myself, have attempted to grow these in our gardens. However, some plant enthusiasts look at flowers with a different eye. Hybridizers of flowers look at plants for ways to try to improve them by making them taller, larger, sturdier, showier, or even change their color. Kevin Vaughn is a plant geneticist who moved from Massachusetts to Mississippi for his profession as well as to develop a passion for creating new flowers for our gardens. Well, daylilies seem to be one of your favorite plants to hybridize. And they're so simple. I mean, a child can do the cross. It's, it's just a very simple process of transferring the pollen to the stigma, like that. The pollen is the fluffy part, and it lays on the stigmatic lip. And if you're lucky, your cross is successful. You get a little pod, like this green structure right here. And in about six to eight weeks, that pod will ripen. You'll find, ooh, you hope a, a great number of seeds, usually not so many. Uh, right. 15, 20 is probably a, a very good number. Uh, you've tagged it with who, you, which pollen you put on that particular plant. Right, so the parents are listed. <laughs> right, so you, as a good hybridizer, you want to make sure you know who your parents are so that if you, if you have to make a really good cross, you can come back next year and do the same cross again. During these times of constant change, hybridizers like Kevin are taking the best traits of some of our most beloved flowers and making them even better for the next generation of gardeners. What does a hybridizer look for in a flower? Well, as a hybridizer, I, I never look at a flower as a, as a finished product. I look at it as the next step. Like when this thing bloomed here, uh, you know, very nice edge, but I wish it were a little wider. So I'm now gonna take this flower, cross it to something with a little more petal width, maybe a hair more ruffling to enhance that fringy edge on there. So I'm always thinking about the next step. Right. We're never happy. My friends call it gilding the lily, and I think it's a very appropriate phrase. So, 10 years ago, round and ruffled was everything. If you had a round, perfectly round flower uh, and it was ruffled, that was it. Right now, gaudy sells. <laughs> and if you can make something that's really bright, or bold, a very contrasted eye, a, a black eye on a yellow, a black eye on a white, something with rims of different colors. That kind of thing is what the daily connoisseur is buying these days. Have you ever wondered what makes some old-fashioned perennials like daylilies and summer phlox so popular? Well, I think it's determined by two factors, beauty and toughness. And I have a prediction that this plant false indigo or baptisia will one day be among them. This Native American wildflower is actually a member of the pea family, and members of its family are comfortable growing all the way from Florida up to Minnesota. 
This plant is actually native to open prairies and can live for decades. And because of its strong, fleshy root system, it can be very drought resistant. In addition to creamy white, it also comes in the color blue, which can be striking against roses, like this one called Caldwell's Pink. And while the blooms of Baptizia are certainly welcomed additions to my garden this time of year, they also make excellent cut flowers for arrangements. I'm always looking for opportunities to add more of these plants to my garden. If you find some and they're small like this, don't be discouraged because once they get established, they can be rapid growers. And as they mature, you can divide them and create more clumps as you do with many other perennials. Any good garden has some form of structure, and usually we think of this coming through trees, shrubs, and certainly hedges. But often we forget that structure can also be reinforced by perennials. And one of my favorite perennials to use this way is the Siberian iris. While I certainly enjoy its delicate flowers, I'm equally carried away by its tall vertical foliage that can look beautiful in my garden throughout the season. These long stem flowers can range in color from white to blue to purple, and some are even maroon or burgundy in color. It's nice that they're so easy to grow. They prefer full sun, but they'll actually tolerate partial shade. And when it comes to soil, as long as it's slightly acidic, they're really not fussy at all. They'll actually grow in wet, heavy clay soils. A good place to plant them is at the base of a downspout. So if you're looking for something to fill up a bed, you might give these guys a try. Summer brings a wide variety of bloom to my garden. Some are exotic and come from faraway places, and others, like these purple cone flowers, are as American as apple pie. They grow wild in fields and along the roadsides in many parts of the country. And of course, you can just about always find them in gardens these days because they're such super perennials. Just look at these blooms. It's amazing how bright and fresh they look even in the hot summer sun. These make excellent cut flowers and I often use them in arrangements. I've discovered that an arrangement like this is the simplest and quickest to put together. I just take various bundles of flowers and drop them into a single container. Now you don't have to grow your own flowers to enjoy them this way. They're plentiful in florist and farmers markets during the summer. With so many blooms out there to choose from, it's easy to get carried away, particularly if you're trying to put together a small arrangement. That's why I've always found it helpful to have a simple basic strategy to follow in the beginning. I start by taking a piece of floral foam that I've soaked in water and I place it in a plastic liner and then secure it with some floral tape. At this point, I have a lot of flexibility because I can slip this liner into a variety of containers. I'm going to use this little terracotta one. Now, the first thing I want to do is establish the finished form of the arrangement, and I'm going to do that by using some of these tall vertical elements. In this case, I'm using Lyetris. For a bold splash of color, I'm using these Asiatic hybrid lilies. To add a little more visual interest, I'm using these purple cone flowers that I picked earlier. And to help soften and fill in, I'm using this lavender aster. I've stayed true to my simple strategy, and for a summer color combination, it's hard to beat clear yellows and lavender. The shape, the size, Everything is there, and it's easy. When the summer heat rolls in, I look for every opportunity to head for a shady location, like this beautiful shade garden. While many regard gardening in the shade as much more of a challenge than working with a sunny location or sun-loving plants, I've found that I can always depend on one tough perennial, hosta, to make any shady environment more beautiful. Hosta is now regarded as the number one most popular perennial in the country, and by the looks of these, it's easy to see why. And they come in huge sizes, medium sizes, small sizes, even teacup sizes. If you're a real connoisseur of teacup plants, the shape, the size, everything is there, and it's easy. Tom Flamang is a hosta enthusiast of the first order. He's been collecting and growing them for over 15 years in his small woodland garden. I had a backyard with a lot of sun perennials in it. As my trees matured, I cut down trees. More trees matured, 
and I had a hard time cutting down my neighbor's trees. So I went in search of plants that grew well in the shade. There are some flowering plants that grow well in the shade. I always use the impatience. I love the white flowers against the emerald greens and the blue greens. But hosta are really a flower without a flower. They come in a tremendous variety, almost unending variety of shapes, sizes, colors, forms, even flower shapes. People are paying attention. Some tosses are fragrant. So I think as people, yards are maturing the same way. They started a new home, the trees grow up, they have all the shade to deal with. Why struggle? When it's so easy to grow a wonderful plant, it just creates a tapestry the same way color would create a tapestry in an annual or a perennial garden. Someone complains they have a shady garden, I say, give it to me, <laughs> give it to me. You'll fill it with hosta. <laughs> well, hosta, um, you can fill it with ferns. Ferns are wonderful. I said, you know, and there's other opportunities. A lot of vines actually like the shade. A lot of azaleas like the shade. And if one selects the more gumpo varieties, which grow low, and they bloom later, they complement your hosta very nicely. Uh, they're fun to have. The hydrangeas are another plant that love the shade. Magnificent architectural plants, magnificent panicular blooms. I don't think you could ask for more. And really, they don't grow well in the sun. No, not at all. They, they're you, much happier in the shade. You lose that total opportunity to have a magnificent plant if you want too much sun. So yeah, please, give me your shady backyard. <laughs> Bring it next to mine. I'll I love expand that. a little. A man who takes lemons and makes lemonade. If you're willing to get past the idea that everything in your garden has to bloom, there's a whole world of beauty and foliage. And as you've seen, Hosta can make a dramatic statement in any garden. This blue-gray variety is one of my favorites. It's called Crossa Regal. I grow it principally for these showy leaves, even though eventually it will bloom. For shady areas, it's always made sense to me to use plants with light foliage or variegation, like this variegated bishop's weed. It can be a vigorous ground cover. You can get a similar effect with this variegated ajuga with the added benefit of a blue flower. And speaking of flowers, if you just can't live without blooms in your shade garden, you might try this interesting plant, the bleeding heart. In just a few years, these young plants will be spectacular. And for blooms throughout the season, I can't imagine my garden without columbine, the beautiful foxglove, and the graceful Japanese anemone. The great thing about all of these plants is that they're perennials. They'll come back in the garden year after year. But for them to flourish in shade, you need to make sure that they stay consistently moist. Well, it's that time of year again when our gardens are making the transition from summer to fall. Now, there's no reason why they shouldn't be just as beautiful as they were several months ago, but it's all about planning. You see, rather than falling into the trap of only planting things that bloom in the spring and summer and spending a lot of money on annuals, I like to save some room in my garden for planting fall-blooming perennials. Besides a traditional chrysanthemum, there are a lot of other flowering plants that are at their best this time of year. And that really shouldn't be any surprise to us if we take our cue from nature. In early fall, in many parts of the country, the roadsides are awash with color from native wildflowers that come back year after year. These include perennial sunflowers, the blue mist flower, or sometimes called perennial ageratum, as well as goldenrod. A lot of people believe that goldenrod causes hay fever. Well, it's simply not true. You see, it's a lot of the other things blooming at the same time that are the culprits, like ragweed. It's a shame that goldenrod has developed this reputation because it can make a fine garden plant. In fact, I grow one in my garden, which is a dwarf variety called golden fleece. There are many other perennials I can't imagine my garden without, like this sedum called autumn joy, and this Mexican sage just now beginning to come into flower. And for shade, a couple of my favorites are the tiny flowered toad lily and this pink flowering hardy begonia. Of course, I've only scratched the surface. There's so many to choose from. If you'd like a list of some unique perennials and some great looking combinations for you to use in your garden, just check out our website. And I hope to see you again next time as we continue to explore the joys of gardening. From the garden, 
I'm Alan Smith. In this garden I dream of a bed of flowers, bluebirds sing of the beauty all around us. And every time the sun comes out, I can't help but smile. Oh, no, I can't help but smile. 